I'd like to ask everyone to stand for the reading of God's word this morning, please. I'm going to be reading from James, chapter 3, 1 through 12. James chapter 3, not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. That verse is kind of scary for me. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and they are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing? My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grape vine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. And I want to reiterate verse 6. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Join with me in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, as we open your word this morning, we want to hear from you. So Lord, I just pray that our hearts and minds will be totally open to your spirits moving, Lord, and help us all to hear from you. And we just pray for your blessing, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Um, I want to say as a disclaimer, or whatever you want to call it, <clears throat> before I preach this message this morning, that it's something I've been wanting to preach for a long time. God has put on my heart. And, but I wanted the timing to be right because I didn't want to be any, anything fresh um, happening in my life or in amongst the church because I don't want people saying, oh, you're just preaching that because of, you know, what happened or whatever. And when I preach, anytime I preach, I can assure you I'm preaching to myself as well. So... As a disclaimer for this morning's message, I just wanted to let you know that. And I pray that if this bothers you this morning, I praise God for that. Because I pray that he wants to communicate to us. It bothers me. And uh, so, anyways. I wanted to share just a couple of things with you this morning. First, a little bit about a, a former youth pastor I know that uh, was seen talking with a prostitute in Camelton just recently. And uh, was seen walking away with her. There's also a longtime church lady attendee that's um, well known in the community that's marrying her fifth husband. Can you imagine five husbands? And unfortunately, uh, the top of the news is a well known pastor in this area who was seen in a kind of a hideaway type restaurant with a woman who was not his wife. What do you think of that? Would you like to know the names? Would you like to know more details? I think in our flesh we do. Oh, tell me more. Tell me more. Who is it? Well, that uh, former youth pastor who was seen with a prostitute in Camelton was actually taking her to Tim Hortons to witness to her because he had been witnessing to her. The longtime church attendee lady that uh, is marrying her fifth husband, while well, she widowed the other four. We assume the worst, don't we? And that well-known pastor 
scene in the hideaway restaurant with a woman that wasn't his wife, he would sit there. You know what? But it could have been the other way, too, couldn't it? It, it could have been legitimately what we were thinking in our mind. But you know what? We do this way too much. We shouldn't be doing it at all. And this phrase just jumped out at me years ago and keeps coming back to me when I fall into conviction or experience it. And that's called sowing discord or dissension. The NIV converts that word. Now, we can go to the next screen. What is the definition of dissension, dissension or discord? I really like discord because I think it's such a powerful word, discord. The definition is a lack of agreement or harmony as between persons, things, or ideas. Or active quarreling or conflict resulting from discord among persons or factions. Strife. Another definition is a combination of musical sounds that strike the ear harshly. A harsh or unpleasant sound. Now you folks know that I'm not a piano player. So if I was to try to play piano, you probably heard. <laughs> we've already heard what? <laughs> the discord this morning? <laughs> but you know, like a, a chord. It's nice, right? Uh-oh, something's happened there. There's a nice chord, right? Here's this chord. Oh, isn't that nice? Oh, beautiful. I want to listen to that all day. This chord. You know, it is easy to laugh at, about stuff like that, but it, it's powerful. Absolutely powerful. So what about dissension or discord? Next screen, please. God hates discord. He hates it. You know, we've, we've come into a society, a generation, that it's all about God is love. God is love, God is love this, love that. And yes, God is love. But you know what? God hates too. Boy, people don't like to hear that. And you know what? This is what's softening us and getting us ready for the Antichrist to come on the scene. If you read prophecy, which someday I may have the nerve to preach about prophecy, the end times, but you can read in your Bible itself. People do not understand God. You know, if we really understand God's wrath and, and on, uh, that he's going to pour out on sin, that he did pour out on sin, our appreciation for his love will be considerably more. But God does hate. And of course, we've got to this, well, God loves the sinner but hates the sin. Okay, show me that in Scripture. I mean, I understand the premise, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But God does not love the unrepentant sinner. He's angry with the wicked every day, it says. As a matter of fact, he hates sin so much, and the sinner, that he poured out his wrath on Christ to redeem them from that wrath. So does God love the person that rejects Christ's payment for their sin? No. The biggest lie of Satan is, you know, these people come back from the dead. Oh, this, everybody goes to heaven. All roads lead to heaven. It doesn't matter what you believe just as long as you're sincere. Wrong. God does hate. And if you look at this verse, this verse is so powerful because it's climactic, okay? In, in Hebrew writings, when they repeat things or use numbers, there's a reason for that. It's not just oh, six particular things, right? Six, of course, keep in mind, is the number of man, and number seven is the number of completion. Proverbs 6.16, there are six things the Lord hates, Seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, 
hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension among brothers, or sows discord. We know about sowing and reaping, right? You always reap more than you sow and later than you sow. God hates those who sow discord. He hates them. You can't get around that. It's not, well, like God doesn't really like it, and you really shouldn't do that. No, God hates it. I don't want to do anything that God hates, and I hope you don't either. What is the source of dissension? Well, we've already seen that in, Hebrew, in uh, James. Proverbs 6, 12. Now, this gets really, <laughs> this is powerful language, and you know, like, well, I'm definitely going to step on some toes this morning, but you know what? It's not me that's stepping. It's the Holy Spirit. A scoundrel and a villain who goes about with a corrupt mouth, who winks with his eye, signals with his feet, and motions with his fingers, who plots evil with deceit in their heart, he always stirs up dissension. Wow, <laughs> that's powerful stuff. It's not just our words, it's our body language. Your reaction to somebody can stir up dissension. I was listening to a preacher earlier this week, and he was saying that there was a lady in the congregation that everybody looked up to, right? And when they had, like, her opinion was gold. And when they had guest speakers in, they'd look to her what her reaction was, to whether they should believe the guy or not. Yeah, I mean, the guy's preaching away, and, and she'd do, you know, whatever, some kind of body language, like, that's stirring up dissension. It's nothing new in our, in our society. It's not even new in the, old, in the New Testament. Look at the Old Testament, stirring up dissension. Moses, man, did he ever get it. Ah, what would you bring us out here for? Oh, yeah, that Moses, he just wants us to suffer. And, and then they did it to God. <laughs> you know, why did you bring God, you know? After many times, God proved himself time and time again, right? But this shows that we have our body language as well as our mouth. In James 3, 6, I've confessed before that when I went back to Bible college after my first year, I read through James five times because my tongue gets in the way. I don't bridle it enough. And so I wanted to just get the bridle on there. And so I read through James five times just before I went back to school. I think it helped. But James 3, 6 says, The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. What's the source of all this dissension and discord? Is it from God? Does God tell us, yeah, you should say that about that person or react that way and just get people stirred up, you know, just, you know, so they're on your side kind of thing. No, it's from hell. Proverbs 16, 28 goes on to say, a perverse man. Oh, these are strong words. It's not like this guy who's still got problems. A perverse man stirs up dissension and a gossip separates close friends. I think most of us have experienced that at least once in our life. Misunderstanding. Gossip's usually a lie. And if it's not, it should be treated as such. But people have been hurt immensely, by misunderstandings quite often because they don't take the time to go and find out what the truth is. And I'll warn you right now, I'm going to, anytime anybody tells me something, I have to be careful how I say this, if somebody comes to me with gossip or um, spreading malicious, I'm going to take you to that person that you are accusing right off the bat, okay? None of this he said, she said garbage. We're going and we're going to work it out, or we're not, <laughs> right? But now, hopefully, do that, because they know what I'm going to do. But if you do, be forewarned, because we can just, we can just bite. The, t the scriptures talk about bite and devour one another. I mean, how descriptive is that? And yet we don't think, ah, I don't really. I was just sharing a prayer concern, right? 
or sowing discord separates close friends. Now this one, I never even noticed this verse before. <laughs> That's what I like about the living word. It's like, woo, it's alive. It cuts you to the quick. You can't, if the Spirit of God is enlightening you, you can't run away from it. Proverbs 17, 4. A wicked man listens to evil lips, and a liar pays attention to a malicious tongue. Hold on a second. <laughs> a wicked man listens? You mean, even if I listen, I'm guilty? Yeah? <laughs> You're a wicked man or woman. A liar pays attention to malicious tongue. Hmm. Well, that's kind of scary. Because we're sharing the guilt of the person that's sowing the discord. Right? Because we're allowing them. We're enabling them. We're listening to them. And let's face it. If our heart is right, we're not going to listen. One of my favorite stories of a, a young lad, because I was that young lad uh, in school, going into grade five, and he had a bad reputation in the school. He was a bad kid. And there was a new teacher for the grade five class. And she pulled the boy aside at the very first of the year and said, Johnny, I've heard all kinds of bad things about you. And he's going, yeah, right, here we go, another one. She said, but you know what? I don't believe a word of it. Give people a chance, right? Don't listen to dissension. Another source of our dissension is seen in Galatians 5.19. Now the works of the flesh, right? Now this is before the works of the spirit, which goes on in, in Galatians 5. Works of the flesh are evident, which are, and here's your list. Oh, incidentally, in this list, this is pretty serious stuff. Did you notice, happen to notice in the, in Proverbs there, 6.16, 16, six things the Lord hates, lying tongue, murder. Like, he puts it in the same list as lying and murder and stealing, and it's pretty serious to God. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, now this is a warning from Paul, that those who practice things, such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Whoa! <laughs> You're telling me that... Okay, now we're not getting into salvation by works here, okay? But the same as uh, in First John it talks about those who are born again, don't sin. Well, we know that we fail, right? Obviously. We don't make a habit of it. We don't practice sin. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I've had people that don't understand the gospel or they're making excuses for rejecting it. You can tell, you're telling me that I can go and kill somebody after I get saved, get born again, go murder somebody and still go to heaven? And I'll say to him, yeah, but chances are you weren't saved in the first place because God is not a murderer, okay? Um, anyways, it's a warning. Those who practice such things will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's God's rule for eternity, and it's also talking about heaven. Well, how can we prevent this? I mean, there's God, God's not going to convict us, and, and it's like not like a, he gives us the law and says, okay, do this, but I know you're going to fail. So good luck with that. How can we prevent this? James 3.8 says, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Well, what can be done then? What, what on earth are we going to do? I love falling back on Jesus' words, but with with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Now, I know that's talking about the, the rich man and the salvation, but it's relative, isn't it? It's relevant to our passage. With God, all things are possible. Jesus also said, without me, you can do how much? Nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. I often, I feel for people, you know, that, you know, they're trying to forgive. I just uh, watched a video, uh, Forgiving Dr. Mengele. 
okay? It was at the library. And uh, this lady, <laughs> you know, she said she forgave him, but I don't know about that. <laughs> you know, that takes supernatural and just her reaction and so on. So we need, to, how can we prevent it? Well, number one, we have the source of Jesus. Now, as that spirit of God works in us and Jesus and God himself, he will help us to pay attention to Proverbs 26, 20. Without wood, a fire goes out, right? You can't have a fire if you don't keep feeding it wood. So, without gossip, a quarrel dies down. As charcoal to embers and, wood, uh, as, and as wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. So number one, rob the fire of its wood, right? Without gossip, a quarrel dies down. You know, somebody wants to share something with you or wants to try spread dissension among the ranks, stop it right there. Look, I don't want to hear about it, okay? You got a problem with that person, go to that person. That's what scripture says. Don't go to somebody else and start saying, nin, 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 nin. you know what? The scripture's quite clear. And you know what? That thing that you have against that person might just be a misunderstanding. And you're bringing God's wrath, and it will come, be assured. You're bringing God's wrath on yourself. Proverbs 25, 23. A north wind brings, brings rain. Yeah, we know about that. So a sly or backbiting tongue, it says in King James, brings angry looks, or at least it should. <laughs> do it, well, no, I shouldn't say do a study because I don't want you to be spreading dissension or gossip, but if you notice people's looks, and if <laughs> I was trying not to look at anybody when I was sharing that information at the front, but inside we're like, yeah, yeah, tell me more. I mean, feed me, feed me. I want to hear that garbage. I mean, look, there's a whole business made out of it. Hollywood, inquirer, inquiring minds want to know. So dissension. I want to hear some dirt, right? Somebody telling you something, if you have a look of disgust on your face and anger, chances are they're going to like, oh, maybe they don't really want to know. And follow it up with maybe verbal, yeah, I do not want to know. A look of disgust can put out the fire of dissension. I'm reminded of a, a camp I worked at where they told the youth, the young people there, next time somebody starts sharing some stuff with you that you don't think is appropriate and it's not good, turn to them and say, do these look like garbage cans to you? Right? That'll stop them in their tracks. I really wanted to have a multimedia thing this morning. I was going to have the match and everything. But I really, really wanted to, and I found it too, but trying to transfer, a little outtake from Bambi, one of my personal favorite animated cartoons from Walt Disney. And Bambi, Thumper, when Bambi was trying to learn how to walk, right? And he's falling in that, and Thumper says, oh, you look funny. And what did Bambi's mom, or Thumper's mom say to him? Thumper, what did your father tell you? We're told as children. And Thumper's like, you know, if you can't say something nice about somebody, don't say nothing at all. Right. That's good advice. Very good advice. But we tend to forget about that, right? I mean, Thumper learned it. Can't we learn it too? The ultimate example and cost of dissension we see in Christ. Mark eleven eight. 8, the, what they were sharing with us this morning, and many spread their clothes on the road and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road, then those who went before and those who cried out, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest! Wow! This is the Messiah! Wow, look at this guy. This is him. This is, this is the promised Messiah. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's capitalized. They're saying, this is the promised Messiah. Wow. And Hosanna means save now. So, all right, here's our Savior. He's here. He's here. This is God. But you know what? Before, during, and after that, what did they say about Jesus? Probably the same people, a lot of them. Oh, he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. If he knew what kind of woman that was, that was bathing his feet, or, oh, he said he'll tear down the temple and build it again in three days. He drives out demons by Beelzebub, by Satan himself. He makes himself to be God. He heals on the Sabbath day, etc., etc. What were they doing? They were sowing discord, sowing dissension against God himself. The same people. Mark 15, 6. Now it was the custom of the feast to release a prisoner whom the people requested. This feast was the Passover feast, which was prophesying Christ, right? Passover. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who committed murder in the uprising. Incidentally, insurrectionists are dissenters of the government. (laughs) They want to talk about spread dissension. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did, which was to release somebody. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing it was out of envy that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barnabas instead of Barabbas. They stirred up the crowd. What were they doing? They were sowing discord. (laughs) They were sowing dissension. It didn't take much. These same people that three days earlier were going, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What happened? What shall I do then? This is Pilate talking. The one, uh, what shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked him. Crucify him, they said. What? Why? What, cru- what crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder. Crucify him! Crucify him! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord to crucify him? What happened with that? Boy, that dissension wasn't very good, was it? That discord. And obviously, (laughs) I mean, that is the epitome of the the ultimate sin, is sowing discord against our Lord. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged, which is extremely painful, and then handed him over to be crucified. Hmm. You know, I never feel I do a topic justice, and I, I really, I don't know. I'm just trusting the Lord will convict us a little bit, at least a little bit. The next time you want to go and sow discord among the brethren, that you'll think about some of these passages. Knowing how much God hates dissension and what its source is, where is it? Does it come from the Holy Spirit? No, it comes from the flesh and the devil. From hell itself, God will never sow dissension among the brethren. Never. So we know its source and how to overcome it. We don't have an excuse, well, I just can't help myself. The devil made me do it. That's garbage. And we know what it cost our Lord Jesus. Why would we ever, ever wish to allow ourselves to do it? This is serious stuff. Some of you might not think it's that serious. Oh, no, that doesn't, that doesn't affect me. I never do that. Well, maybe not. Highly unlikely. I'm sure you've at least been affected by it. Knowing the sweet melody and harmony of a true Christian love and not just the command that Jesus gave us to love one another, but shouldn't we also, he also give us the desire 
to love one another? He put his spirit in us. So why wouldn't we? Discord or harmony? Next, next screen. Discord or harmony? What will you choose? Because you have a choice. Nobody makes you do anything. Ask yourself, what will you choose next time the opportunity arises? Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we know that this is serious business. We know that not just relationships, but churches and even nations have been destroyed because of sowing dissension and discord. And Father, I pray that your spirit will permeate our hearts in such a way that we will never, ever want to be involved with any of this. Because we know it doesn't please you. And we know it's right from Satan himself. So Father, please help us to look to you and to be guided by your spirit. And love one another as you have loved us. Lord, give us that supernatural love. And may we be burdened for one another's burdens and your burdens and share your love with those around us. We thank you and praise you, and we thank you for the opportunities that we have to have fellowship around your table, communion, and, and worshiping you in your, in your church. And Lord, as we go downstairs now to share around the food, I pray that our hearts will be lifted up to you and that we will enjoy one another's company and, and rest in the assurance that you will work out your kingdom if we surrender to you. So guide us and keep us, we ask. In Jesus' name and for his glory, amen. Have a final thought.